Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the Doctor Who Missing Episodes podcast. My name's Tim and I'm joined here in our secret Missing Episodes bunker by Paul. Yeah, hello again. Good to be back. I, what's that I can hear in the back? Have you got some monks round again? What? Oh no, that's just the gramophone there. I, I needed to de-stress after that business earlier, Paul. Oh. Horrifying. Anyway, I'll turn that off. Yeah, about earlier. It was... It was just a simple misunderstanding, and I'm... Ah, hello, Tim. What are you up to? Ah, well, due to the recent security breach... Oh, yeah, the station manager again. Yeah, lovely fella, but yeah, we don't want any more episodes going missing, do we? Uh, which is why I'm putting up this sign. Anyway, take a butcher's. I'm just going for a pee. What's this say? Top secret missing episodes bunker. All asses must be shown. Oh, I'm not entirely sure that, how that helps with security. Well, I suppose it does ensure I'm not hiding away any film cans anywhere. Well, in for a penny. I'll go and sit at the recording desk. Hey up, Tim. What's that you got in your hand? It's just the pee I was going for. I'll just finish this sign, then I'm with you. All passes must be shown. Ah. Right. Lovely. Ah, there you are, Paul. How you doing? Ah! Yeah, well, let's just try and move on and hope you get retrousered soon. Yes. In this episode, we're discussing the last serial of season two, The Time Meddler. And while last time we were celebrating the return of one episode of The Crusade, this time we can celebrate the return of three full episodes, making it the first complete serial that we'll be covering. Yeah, it's pretty heavy going on the missing episodes front after this, though, isn't it? Oof. Um, should I introduce our guest? I think you should. I mean, we've had him locked in the inner vault for safekeeping all week. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he snuck out last night when I took him his breakfast this morning eggs and toast and tea he sounded an awful lot like a tape recording you know it's probably just the new zealand accent i'll go and let him out yeah just be careful he doesn't chuck the bedpan contents in your face again <laughs> <laughs> so i guess this episode is the author of the time link continuity guides he's written countless magazine and fanzine articles on doctor who over the years he's the second consecutive kiwi to appear on the podcast and he is perhaps best known in missing episode circle as the man or one of the men behind www.broadcast.org which is the fantastic online resource which tracks the broadcast of every episode of doctor who around the world welcome john preddle Hello, how are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Your um, your ears must have been burning during the last episode about the lion, because we mentioned you about half a dozen times. Indeed, yes. Yes, in fact, uh, I didn't need to put my heaters on. <laughs> I've got one burning question. It was mentioned that you investigated the current status of the dump in Wellington, and we couldn't settle on whether it was a football field or <laughs> a car park. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a football field. Oh, <laughs> have you been there with your metal detector and bucket and spade? I have actually. Um, well, I've been there. I haven't taken a spade, although it was tempted. Yes, I, I know. I know pretty much the spot, the precise spot where this trench, where these films were dumped in, is. And I've stood there and had a little cry, <laughs> <laughs> knowing what was potentially beneath my feet. Did you have a quick kick about while you were there? Well, the actual area where the films were dumped is to the side of the field itself. It's not in the middle of the football the pitch. It's to the, to the side. It is bonkers, this, the depths of this investigation that Team New Zealand has done on these film cans. It's crazy. Yeah, um, the location was known because the guy who actually found the line, the guy who rescued the line from, from the tip itself, he's still alive. And, and he's been, he's been, you know, we, we've, we've interviewed him and he was able to show us where it was. And um, I, I, I even went to all the trouble and effort. It was quite fun to do so. I went to the Wellington City Council archive uh. and I pulled up all their um, files on this field. 
and I found aerial photographs and I found memos and um, other paperwork relating to the transitioning of the field from the refuse site into the public area into the public ground so there's you know there's a, there's a quite a long history of the actual ground itself have you ever considered going to ethiopia john <laughs> <laughs> get you and scoons not, not currently and... no um, <laughs> if i did i'd have to go into quarantine for 14 days uh that's true in both directions i think the investigation that the, the lot of you have pulled off from knowing where the films were dumped knowing who picked them up knowing where they were stored knowing where they were sold to having it on a dvd that on a shelf behind me i think it's just absolutely bonkers brilliant i think it's fantastic yeah it's one of the few examples of a missing episode being found where it can be pretty much plotted or traced from its arrival in new zealand yeah. all the way through to its recovery again if almost every single step of the way just by pure fluke of the fact that the people who were, were involved a are still alive um, and that there's a lot of paperwork that still exists that supports you know the where's and the when's and the how's. Fantastic. Fantastic. Anyway, more of that later, perhaps. Indeed. That sort of thing later, anyway. Shall we talk about the time meddler? Oh, yeah, why not? So, what we normally do, and we'll keep that normal running order, is we talk about a bit of the background to the time meddler and its, its sort of position in these early days of the show and then we'll do a bit of a talk about the characters and the characterization and then we do a bit of a review what we thought of it and then we talk about the missing episodes aspect so we'll talk to john a lot more later on about broadcast and about the missing episodes aspect it's the last story of season two as paul has already said and there's a lot of change going on. So it's the first story with Hartnell as the last of the original cast. Ian and Barbara have just departed. And we see the introduction of Stephen. It's Dennis Spooner's last script before leaving to work on The Baron with his mate Terry Nation. And we also see the arrival of Donald Tosh as script editor. But apparently he didn't have to do much because... Dennis Spooner knew his onions and John Wiles arrives for the start of his happy relationship with William Hartnell. That all makes it sound like it should be a much more turbulent and, and messy and complex production than it is but I think despite all that going on behind the scenes it comes out pretty much unscathed because as you said Dennis Spooner is a safe pair of onions and those is, and those is, and those his hands so what we get is a what we get is a nice little epilogue to the first two seasons of the show but also a springboard into something new it's deceptively lightweight isn't it deceptively airy piece of mm. fluff but somehow manages to slide in a whole new approach for the show a new way of doing historical stories a new way of, of using time travel within the, the series and he, and he does, does all that under the guise of comedy so it's um deceptively straightforward and yet influential beast this one it was a big contrast to watching everything that we've watched so far you know heavy um it made everything we've watched so far mm -hmm. quite heavy no i don't want to say turgid but do you, do you know what i mean it was it's so light it is and not always in a good way you know i mean i think it's strengths the comedy side is its strength but um i think it's generally believed that the vikings and saxons plot is rather superficial and rather dull <laughs> and rather cur and <laughs> rather cursory it could kind of makes you wonder whether because they're coming towards the end of the, the recording block because yeah. after this yeah. they did galaxy 4 and then they did mission to the unknown so it kind of makes you wonder whether they're kind of doing this as the, as, as a, a gradual getting towards their holidays they're kind of um it's a, they're winding down so they're wanting to do something yeah, a bit yeah. more light and a bit more fun Dennis Spooner writing something by its very nature it's going to be lighter because he always wants to hmm. to make light of everything we talked about how he was rather it seemed a bit unsure on Reign of Terror and understandably because the show itself was still in its infancy and it was his first attempt at it we skipped over the Romans but I mean that was showing him becoming much more confident and this this is um, another step isn't it another step forward I mean we've <laughs> because every story we've done by the sheer lucky chance of what su what's didn't survive has been a historical. We've been also telling a parallel story of the evolution of, of these steps into history. 
And we've talked about how David Whittaker's original idea that they should be talking about the great events and the great people of history has, has gradually fallen by the wayside. Rumours of their demise may have been premature in the last, in the last episode. Yes, in that we both said, I think, that the, uh, the crusade was the last instance of it happening, but we forgot about the massacre. Oh, well. But, I mean, you can imagine a, a David Whittaker version of this story where we meet the great figures, Harold Hardrada, Harold Godwinson. Well, it, just within that one 12-month period, you could have any of those. You have, uh, William the Conqueror would have been the obvious pick, but we get none of those. We don't get the Venerable Bede. We just get a funny member of the Doctor's race with his own TARDIS and some extremely cardboard cut-out Vikings. Well, I did a little Twitter poll this time, because you told me off last time for not doing yes. it. Yes. And about 80% of the 50 or so participants did it at school. I did mm. it when I was 11, mm. and I feel like it's, it's very clear and crisp. Presumably you did it in New Zealand, John? No. Not at all. No. I, I was struggling to think of what things historically we did at school, but the only things I can think of of history that we learnt in school that has proved any of any value uh, any value to me in later life was when we studied South America in, in um, high school geography, <laughs> and so you know when I was researching Venezuela and Chile and uh, Brazil for you know for the, for, for broadcast, it suddenly all popped it back into my head. <laughs> Ah. Whereas, ironically, quite a lot of what I know about world geography comes from uh, reading about Doctor Who missing episodes. Yeah. I, I know astonishing <laughs> amounts about Africa. My wife is constantly wondering, what? what? <laughs> when did you become an expert on Sierra Leone? But from history, the only things we learnt were the, the unification of Italy and the origins of the First World War. Those are the only things I can think of that we we learnt uh, from a European from a European perspective. So the phrase 1066 and all that wouldn't mean anything to you down under? I certainly knew about it, I just don't recall how and where I knew about it, but it wasn't It's a school. given and a tenet and a cliche that 1066 is the start of the history of modern Britain, isn't it? Whether you believe whether it's true or not, it's, it's what a certain generation, including the generation who would have been behind, behind Doctor Who and behind the cameras and, and watching the programme in 1965 would have thought. Presumably you covered it at school, Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. What I found interesting in this, versus especially the Crusade, is the Crusade, the history lesson, is left deliberately woolly in that the Doctor says, oh, he'll, he, he will or won't see Jerusalem, and he doesn't explain what will happen. And that's quite a murky bit of history, and that the history isn't very crisp. It's very complicated. There's one of, what, four Crusades, was it? Yep. And most people don't know what happened. I don't really know what happened. In this, the most obvious bit of history that everyone in the UK, I imagine, learnt at school, they're at pains to spell out yep. what happened. There's a again there's and again lots and again. of exposition from the Doctor talking to the camera. They're so keen that you know that the Doctor talks to himself, just to make sure that we're... <laughs> Is, is it the lack of the companion that makes him do that? I don't know. I just found it in know. contrast well, it's, to... It's clearly the just the whim of the individual writer, which means that Verity Lambert wasn't that... Nobody higher up than the writer was that bothered one way or the other. There's an interesting blooper in uh, in the story because there's a scene where um, Stephen and Vicky find the wristwatch and Stephen yes. says, what's a wristwatch doing in 10th century? Um, which yeah. it should be the 11th century. Yeah. But 10th yeah. century is in the script. So it makes you wonder, mm. you know, how no one picked up on that during the making of the thing, during rehearsals or during... <laughs> it's quite a common mistake, wouldn't it, back in the day, to misunderstand the difference between centuries and, and years. <laughs> Even though we, we educated people of the 20, 20th century, sorry, 21st century, would never make such a slip. <laughs> Uh -huh. It's also the return since the Crusade, the first return of Douglas Canfield and Barry Newbury. It was done on the cheap because they splurged all their budget on the chase. But I don't know why I was particularly honed in on this, but I thought Newbury's sets on this were superb. I thought it was really good oh, considering they are. considering it's entirely, almost entirely set outdoors. I think they do a marvellous job of recreating it in the studio. And 
the magic of television was brought home a little bit when I was looking through photographs of this. There's a photograph of the very, very basic set that they have for the base of the cliff where they dematerialize and they have the first scene where the doctor is flicking pebbles down the boulder and the monk is somehow hidden from them a few inches below. They 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 somehow managed to make you think, or make me think, maybe I'm a simpleton, that they're actually on the coast. And the studio looks so basic. You know, the the boulder is on a massive raised plinth. The panels for the, the, the rock face behind are very, very clear and narrow. And yet somehow Camfield makes it, it seem, using sound effects and cutting in a bit of stock footage of the sea mm. and this it, it makes it really effectively come alive and it's the same when they're on the cliff tops very convincing ground and little twigs poking up and they've got this back projected sky going on yeah and a wind machine and i think it's really he's gone to the trouble of getting effective of, of building a set well because he obviously works very well with with Newbury, building a set where you can get those yeah. angles, which makes all the difference. We can have some shots up and down, which, to be honest, you wouldn't... You wouldn't Richard Martin wouldn't have bothered, would he? But you know what I think. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I think. <laughs> Douglas Camford and Warris are saying we're the masters of um, of making a small studio set look like look mm. like an epic. There's also the forced perspective buildings on the monastery. That's, yeah. that's, that's, mm. and there's a light that comes on and off. Yeah. I think Paul hit a, um, a key thing there, is that from a production point of view Camfield is experimenting he's doing new stuff he's a brand new director he, you know, he's new to this so he's mm. testing and trying the, the, the capabilities of the equipment he's got whereas you look at something like uh, the Space Museum and the Chase that came before I mean they <laughs> are so clunky and creaky because you've got these old <laughs> these old farts who uh, you know, literally just point the camera and get and, and just shoot the actors doing their business there's no there's no sort of art to what the, they've done, uh, yeah. but the Camfield Camfield is trying new stuff, and it, and it shows. It definitely, I'm going shows. to have another pop at Richard mm. Martin because I won't get a chance because unfortunately none of his stories are missing. <laughs> but can you imagine what the web? Can you imagine what the web planet would have looked like if uh, if Camfield had directed it? Yeah, it have... or even Dalek Master Plan, um, Invasion of Earth, or The Chase. They would have been a lot a lot more slicker and probably a lot more. Uh, you know, more I'm not going to go favorable. on about the camera work. I've just made one note of one particularly nice shot, just at random. There were there were more. But um, in episode two, there's very nice, I'm going to say it was a pull focus shot, perhaps it wasn't. It pulls from the back of the set, past the beardy Saxons, all the way up to Eldrad, who suddenly appears in the foreground. And I, just, I, I was quite taken aback by how <laughs> elaborate this, this shot... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a very elaborate shot to do with those clunky cameras and uh, clunky actors. You find that, uh, that with a lot of the Hartnells, is some of the more experimental directors tended to only ever work on one story because they either, either overwent their budget or they kind of were working against what the BBC was wanting. And yet Camfield, who was, was also doing this, you know, stuck around, which is quite, quite astonishing when you think about it. And Richard Martin, who overshot his budget on the last one, I don't think he... Did he do any more? No, I'm afraid we've seen the back of I don't think uh, he did. Uh, Richard Martin. Who seems like a lovely fellow. <laughs> The interesting thing in the story here for me, and it's something I've only just picked up on in preparing for this podcast, is that having watched Marco Polo, and I know the, the Aztecs pretty well, and the Reign of Terror, is the big theme all along, and indeed in this, is that you can't mess around with history. Yeah. And so the, it became really apparent to me watching this that the big threat here is that messing up of history. And I wonder if the audience at the time would have had that view. Oh my God, he's messing with history. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's been really crystallized for me watching this and having watched all the historicals leading up to this. The, it's not the, th the threat has always seemed slightly comical because it's Peter Butterworth. But the threat is meant to be the big issue is that he is messing with history and it's never really resonated before with me until watching now. it in sequence in context it may cause a slight um double take on the part of the audience because the doctor hasn't said we mustn't meddle with history as in the consequences would be unfathomable he said you can't so the peril in all these previous historicals has been something specific to the story mm. being separated from each other from the ship whatever warlords on their on their trail here 
suddenly we're told you can, and the doctor doesn't explain his change of heart. Of course, he doesn't have to, because all the people, Ian and Barbara, have gone. So the people he previously told you can't change history aren't there to say, but hang on a minute. <laughs> so I think even though we're only two years in, the programme's format is evolving. And um, as all good writers do, he's bending the rules to fit the story he wants to tell. He's not thinking, I'm going to fundamentally change the premise of this show now. He just thinks, no. I've got a funny story. Wouldn't it be good if there was another character with a similar time machine to the Doctor's who wasn't, didn't have the same moral sensibilities or who had a, an amoral perspective? Because, of course, he implies he's trying to improve the world by tweaking it. Yeah. <laughs> you can really dig down to the depths here because he, he, he does say, that, he does list some of the previous changes he's made, like helping... The Druids build Stonehenge with his anti-gravity devices. Now, you know, according to the Doctor's oh, yes. rules, if he had landed at that point, 4000 BC, he would have had to prevent the um, the construction of Stonehenge because it's not a natural occurrence. It's something a monk had fiddled with. So it doesn't really bear close scrutiny, the logic of this. Just like, as we've said before, the whole, you can change events if you land in the future of the television show if you land in the future you can change events if you land in the past you can't it's never made any sense it's always a bit hand wavy yeah i mean the other things which don't bear scrutiny are the fact that he leaves him there in 1066 as if he can't do anything bad from 1066 <laughs> he, whereas you know he could have them all on on pentium processors in a couple of hundred years yeah, still from 1066 still got his grandfather's wristwatch and his rocket launches yeah <laughs> and all the all the technology that he's chosen to take to 1066 is from 1966 why isn't it why isn't it hover, why isn't it hoverboards and ipads and fitbits and <laughs> plus if he helped if he helped build stonehenge does he know about the underhenge <laughs> oh. well my answer to that is i mean we could look into that if we had a rematch and where the hell's he been for the last 50 years, the, the monk. Did that make it into your time link books, John? No, no, no. My time link <laughs> books kind of ended at the end of David Tennant's era. So. Ooh, well, it's time for volume three. Yeah. <laughs> Get the monk involved in the Pandorica. <laughs> so let's move on and look at the characters and the, the uh, characterization. Peter Butterworth, the monk. It's the first instance of meeting a another person of the Doctor's race. It's a big moment for the history of the show. I wonder how it would have landed at the time. Would it have been a big deal? That kind of depends. We have to look at what the audience of 1965 would have thought without viewing it too much from our perspective of another 50 years of the programme. You say that we're meeting another member of the Doctor's race. Well, at this point, it is still far from established that the Doctor isn't human. Now, I know opinions differ on this. I've, I've seen it argued quite convincingly that... <laughs> It's not pinned down that he's definitely an alien until quite late, surprisingly late in the day. All that's hmm. said here, for what it's worth, is that he's from the same place as the Doctor. Oh, is it? Yeah, place, <laughs> not even time. It, what, what does that mean? The, the place could be a euphemism for a future, a, a future Earth. Who knows? Hmm. From a viewer's perspective, you know, that cliffhanger of part three when they discover another TARDIS... I mean, it's hard to judge, of course, but you know, from a modern audience, you know, it's like you know, the sudden revelation that that Missy is who she is. I think it still has a lot of power, even now. I was still thought that's it's, a bloody good. My gosh, cliffhanger. he's got a, he's got another TARDIS. You know, the monk's got a TARDIS. Yes. Was that a water cooler moment in, in the, for the equivalent in 1965? I think it must have been. You know, there's something up with the monk, but that is not going to be what you're thinking. That's going to be fair. If the audience in 1965 would have been well. For, okay, can I take it back a bit? Stephen, the sceptic, isn't at all convinced that they're in the past. And rather than being shown proof quite early on and having to accept it, he's constantly being shown bits of evidence that seem to confirm his position. He's, he's see, finding wristwatches and bits of modern technology lying around, which even into episode two, I'm wondering what are the audience supposed to be thinking? We know from our perspective that this is a story about time meddling, a story where anachronistic technology has been brought into 1066. But what would the audience of the time have thought? Might they have thought this? We've only just had a story with this, what was supposed to be a, appear to be a haunted house turned to be a theme park. Might they have thought this was a the modern world with people pretending to be Saxons? I think that I think there's actually an element of mystery which lasts until maybe hmm. episode three, from that perspective. Okay, moving on. 
Peter Butterworth is is brilliant. I love him. I've always enjoyed Peter Butterworth. And he's so well serviced by this story by virtue of the William Hartnell having the holiday in the second episode he doesn't say a word in the first episode but then he is so well serviced by it he can just be Peter Butterworth for three episodes and I think it's absolutely magical and I can't think of a previous instance where a guest star a guest villain has had quite so much to do so as a fan of Peter Butterworth and the Carry On films myself, I think it's a delight to watch. I revel, as does Peter Butterworth, in all of his little touches and comedy moments, even from the start when he's implausibly eavesdropping on the three of them from about 12 inches below them with none of them spotting. He reacts, and I don't know why, but when the Doctor does his stuff about, you know, if we'd have if we'd arrived in the Indian Mutiny, <laughs> the TARDIS might have appeared as a howder. Peter <laughs> Butterworth's face explodes <laughs> at howder. It's really magical and random. And then you see more of his stuff later on, where he hitches up his robes to run away from the Saxons at the end. And he has when he's cooking the Doctor's breakfast in episode two, he does it with real relish. And I just think it's a real gift. It's one of my favourite performances in Doctor Who. We're lucky that he was that good because the entire story is rested on this character. None of the other characters Absolutely. offer any yeah. uh, opportunities to the actors at all, and they thus fail to rise to the occasion. So, yeah, it would have really fallen flat if um, if they'd somehow cast somebody who didn't take this part by the by the throat. There's a marvelous story with Peter Butterworth, who, like so many actors of that time, he fought in the war. And he actually ended up in a prison camp with none other than Talbot Rothwell, who was the, <laughs> the writer for all of the Carry On films. Th there's a marvellous story, and it's quite similar to uh, it's quite similar to the Al Jolson story, where he goes to a talent contest, and and it's a Al Jolson alike, look alike competition, and enters it, and he comes third or whatever. That during the war he was shot down in holland as a pilot of his crew of three two of them survived and were carted off to various german prisoner of war camps and he actually ended up in the camp where the wooden horse escape happened so peter butterworth himself was one of the guys who was running along and jumping over the wooden horse while there were two chaps inside tunneling <laughs> out of the camp and he took part in that escape and I think he got recaptured by a Hitler youth or whatever it was however a few years later when they came to film the wooden horse he applied to appear in it and was told no he's not the right figure <laughs> he's not athletic enough to appear in the <laughs> film even though he was actually there <laughs> during the war tunneling out and his story is quite remarkable there's a there's a very it's very dated now but there's a 1970s this is your life that he appears in and they wheel out all these old war veterans who tell of his exploits in the war and he's a he's got a really remarkable heroic story which is just lovely and um it's also lovely that you know he met Talbot Rothwell and then became a comic actor even though he has this great story of heroism behind him and uh, sadly he died very prematurely but yeah love Peter Butterworth love his performance what I also find and I think it's been said by others involved is that William Hartnell's performance is lifted by Peter Butterworth being there and you can see that in the the interplay yes he's he's definitely trying to be as sharp as he can be when in scenes with with butterworth isn't he mm. although I've, I've seen people suggest that butterworth was ad-libbing quite a lot of his dialogue and i don't think hartnell would have been that keen on that would he he was full of practical jokes apparently off when the others were on camera and he wasn't he was trying to put them off and all sorts of stuff going on <laughs> there's still a lot of inappropriate giggling from hartnell this time isn't there difficult to know how much of that's scripted and sometimes i just can't help one sometimes wondering You're obsessed with hartnell's giggling. i am he's demented <laughs> i don't know if it's supposed to be a dramatic counterpoint that sometimes he's giggling at some dire consequences of his of his enemy's plans and then he'll turn it round very suddenly maybe it was real mead that he was drinking is that episode one or episode three when he's he drinks a horn of mead i mean, maybe that was real <laughs> yeah 
I I found his performance to be really sharp throughout. In episode one, obviously he wasn't there for episode two. But that stuff in the TARDIS at the start, he's very good. Oh, yeah. And then he's very cutting and withering when he's out on the on the beach with Steve and the space helmet for a cow. He delivers all that yep. very well. Yes, he gets a lot of good and complicated lines right. And because he gets one line hilariously, <laughs> extraordinarily <laughs> wrong, people overlook the rest of it in favour of... Um, some stuff about mountain goats there's a bit where it dawns isn't there where, <laughs> where where he knows he's cocked up and then he throws in and besides i hate climbing i thought that was quite good he knew they weren't going to cut so he pulls it out the fire bless him with the doctor absent for episode two it's also quite interesting that not only do you get peter butterworth thrown into the limelight you also have new arrival Stephen, who <laughs> two episodes in and he's the leading man he is and he isn't. It's an interesting mixture. It's very nicely written. I, I would have been very upset on Vicky's behalf if Stephen had suddenly become the leading man in all respects, competent, capable, instantly understanding the situation he's been thrown into and leaving her relegated to the role of soppy 15-year-old. I, th I think they, the, the balance between Vic and Stephen is, is very nicely worked out here. She, she's yeah. able to be promoted. She's she's definitely been promoted suddenly. It's, they don't overlook the fact that she is now the senior member of the crew. It could have been written with her, again, in a very soppy way, believing that they're in 1066 because the Doctor says so. It, an earlier Vicky would have, might have been like that, just been, been doe-eyed. But she's played with a lot of... She suddenly seems to have aged 10 years since just in a matter of months. I think you'll find too with the character of Stephen is he, he's not an Ian Chesterton replacement. He's his own character and you can tell from the stories he's in that he's no. more a man of action. He, he does a lot more physical, uh, like sword fighting and um, you know, he, he's, he gets more involved. So um, yes, this is his first story and he's a very much a skeptic with his I don't believe it IDBI comments. So he's, he's thrown into this situation, but he's, you know, he's the audience. He's, a, he's acting for the audience, although you know, most of the audience probably knows you know, are one step ahead. Of, of the characters by that point, aren't they? Yeah. What I found particularly interesting is he, he's making very different acting choices from William Russell. Ian was sceptical in the early days, but what, he would say everything with that William Russell sort of half-smiling charm. When you think back to, to an earthly child, but that's mm. fantastic, Doctor. You mean to say this is a police box in a junkyard? It can go anywhere mm. in time and space. That's fantastic. Whereas Purvis, who's acting Stanislavski way, is just going for it and in the same and in yeah. the same way to what later happened with michael craze and ben chapman he can run the risk of coming across unnecessarily angry he's very sardonic isn't he and sarcastic yeah. but i mean he, he very often turns a a line that is just a mild rebuttal of what vic has said into <laughs> jumping down her throat it's very interesting he doesn't push it too far which is why stephen is sticks around and and, and stays successful but there's a big difference between Stephen and Ian, though. Ian is a, you know, a man from the 1960s. Stephen is supposedly a, you know, a man from the future. He's Dan Dare, so he's he should be less sceptical about, not necessarily time travel, but some of the situations he, he later gets into, he should just be taking that in his stride because it's you know, it should be fairly common to him. That's what I was wondering, how much diff the startling difference between Stephen and Ian is in the scripts and how much is just acting choices and as you say because they half the time forget that he's in the future the same way some of the comments from the past i think i mean yeah well purvis has made the comment that you know some of the scripts that he ended up getting he you know he, he always t took them to be someone's just gone and you know done a find replace for ian or barbara and just given given him them their lines so the, the characterization of a man from the future seems to be lost in translation just simply because the writers were writing for completely different characters at the point of commissioning and by that by that same token he's also very comfortable and familiar with the accoutrements of the 1960s mm. isn't he but vicky is in the same situation she's from the future as well she's from the 30th yeah. century so from the rest we have some token vikings three vikings a handful of saxons eldred not eldred eldred must live Edith, played by Althea Charlton in her second appearance of the show, she plays a similar looking character <laughs> in 100,000 BC. I thought she, I think she's terrific. She is. She is. Although, once again, we're submitted to brutal sexual violence in a kid's Doctor Who story from 
from 1965. It's very bizarre that the censors chose not to cut the scene of her being found having been raped and elected to cut 12 seconds of dummies being run through with swords. <laughs> I find it remarkable, really, what the censors chose to to cut and what the what this reoccurring theme that we keep seeing of... First of all, we've had Ella Keir, uh, and he's bloody awful, horrible character, and then we have insistence that we don't only see the Vikings pillaging, but we see them raping as well. It's remarkable. But it's done in such a way that if you weren't aware of what yeah. likely happened off screen, it kind of might pass you by. The way it's the way it's yeah, shot, she's might, just lying down. She's, she's not like naked or anything. So yeah, adults watching would know what's happening, but kids wouldn't and probably wouldn't question it. The censors in New Zealand were sort of, I'll say notoriously, and I, I don't mean that in a bad way, but were extremely conservative uh, for oh, the yeah. time um, even then. And, and, it, and it didn't get cut out in New no, Zealand. No, it didn't, it? Uh, which is very, you're right, it is very unusual. There's a line in The Myth Makers where one of the characters says the word adultery. Snip. Just the word adultery <laughs> wow. has got the snip wow. in uh, by the New Zealand censors. So yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it is a surprise that maybe they didn't pick it up. The, the, yeah, you know, goes back to my original not, yeah. comment. Is maybe it was done in such a way that even the censors didn't didn't pick up on it. They may may have been having a cup of tea at the time, and it kind of like went past. So. Reviewing the episode as a whole, do we enjoy it, fellas? Very much so. I think it's great. It's, when, you, when you look at the stories either side of it, you know, the chase and what we can see of Galaxy 4, it kind of sticks out as being something different from a production point of view. Mm. But it's a hoot. It, it's a great comedy romp. It, I don't think it has anything in it that's cringeworthy, but um, I think it's great. I just enjoy it. And the buzz I get out of watching it, particularly episode 4, is knowing that this is exactly the same episode in a way that you know, went out on television in New Zealand back in 1966, uh, <laughs> uh, 60, 68 or 69 or whenever it was. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the same footage. Yeah, it's terrifically enjoyable, very, very funny. The plot stands up better nowadays to a modern audience than a lot of the plots from this era, but it still seems intriguing. And um, if, I don't know, if Spooner had had the time or inclination to put a little bit more effort into characterising the, the Vikings and the Saxons, then it could be an absolute stone-cold classic. But really, it's not a major criticism. It's not that those scenes are bad, it's just that they they suffer by comparison with the stuff around them. Yeah, it's one of my favourites. Yeah, I really enjoy it. And I, 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 really, <laughs> I really love Peter Butterworth, as you might have detected. I thought it'd be interesting. In, in, so one of the volumes, one of the things that I use to research is this multi-part uh, part work, Complete History, which has the DWM Andrew Pixley notes in them and it's a fantastic resource and one of the things in the time meddler is that he quotes an audience research report issued on the watcher from thursday the 5th of august and it canvassed 168 people and people are genuinely fascinated by the discovery of the wristwatch the gramophone and the electric lights and found it to be a good twist <laughs> but there were complaints and one of them reads I didn't understand this at all since when were there wristwatches and gramophones in 1066 I thought it was an absolute waste of time watching <laughs> something that didn't make sense <laughs> yes and another comment that says I can't understand what a gramophone etc has to do with early Britons it just seems silly <laughs> so yeah that's what some of the audience thought in <laughs> 1965 I thought that was brilliant we're now on to the missing episode section and as i mentioned at the start john runs the definitive online resource that covers the broadcast of doctor who around the world and therefore is a brilliant resource for trying to figure out what broadcast where in terms of missing episodes john why why have you done this? <laughs> That's a very good question, and it's something I ask myself every day. <laughs> yeah, um, the origins of the research goes back to the early mid-80s because I was interested in compiling the New Zealand broadcast dates because Doctor Who was screened on a regional basis back in the 60s, so there were four 
screenings of each episode uh, in the four various main regions. So I went through our publication, which is called the New Zealand Listener, which would be our, our um, equivalent of the Radio Times. So I just went through those and compiled a list of all the air dates for the New Zealand screenings up uh, from, from 60, 1964 onwards to 84, 85. And later on, when the discovery of the film records still held by TVNZ, which recorded the film print movement when they sent films overseas, one of the countries listed uh, against a lot of the stories was Singapore. So I always had a fascination of you know, the fact that the film prints had been moved to other countries. And then in 2003, right. so we, yeah, this is a huge jump. We're talking almost 20 years. I was traveling to the UK to go to Panopticon. And my stopover took me to Singapore. And I was in Singapore for three days. And my hotel just happened to be across the road from the public library. So I thought, oh, okay, I might just put aside some time and have a look to see if I can find any uh, Hong, uh, Singapore TV guides or newspapers, which I did. And I managed to compile a listing of the Singapore air dates. And then it was a couple of years later, I thought, I wonder whether there's anywhere in New Zealand that's got foreign newspapers. So I did some research and I found that one of the libraries at one of the universities had a collection of foreign papers. And one of the papers there was uh, Rhodesian Herald. So I had a look right. at those, and yeah, sure enough, I found the Doctor Who listings in them. So I thought, okay, this is good. What else do they have? And they had some Australian newspapers, so I went through those and compiled listings of the Australian uh, air dates. So I kind of got to the point where I thought, oh, this is actually quite exciting, because if I can track down other newspapers, I can compile a full listing of all the countries and all the air dates where Doctor Who has screened over the years. Because this this was in the days when you know the lists of countries that had screened the show were you know, published in Doctor Who magazine, but there was always the statement where they would say, "Yeah, Doctor Who is screening in sixty countries around the world and, and is watched by a hundred million viewers." And I was thinking, "Gosh, sixty countries—that's a lot to have to research." <laughs> and plus, I didn't really have a full list of what those sixty countries were. But I just kind of thought, "I'll, I'll do the best that I can." So the next time I um, I thought I'll travel overseas, I'll I'll go to the local library to see what I can find. And then it was on one of the forums where someone made a comment about the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. having a huge newspaper collection. Mm. And I was traveling over to uh, Los Angeles that year to go to the Gallifrey Convention. So I did some sums and worked out how much time off I could take. And I thought, I might after the convention, I might travel on to um, D.C., which I did. And I spent two weeks there at the, the Library of Congress going through their vast, wow. vast newspaper collection. So this is in um, 2009. So yeah, again, it was a few years later. Basically, that was where it started. I just went through all the newspapers that they had, you know, looking through the microfilms for, for the air dates. And it was around that time that, because I'd passed the Singapore and the Rhodesian air date data that I'd compiled by that point on to people like Andrew Pixley and Richard Beacon or Richard Molesworth, etc., just to say, look, you know, this is fun. There might be some more of these that I can do. And it was when I was in Washington that I first got uh, I got contacted by Paul Venezes, who um, had also seen the material I put together. And he was telling me, oh, you look up this, this country, look up this country, look up this country. So not only did I have the list of places that I knew about from the lists, I was also getting information about where else I could look. So I came back home after that trip, and I thought, okay, it's almost like an addiction. I thought, where are there more newspapers? So I did some Googling and discovered that the, um, the National Library of Australia, which is in Canberra, had a huge, vast collection of foreign newspapers. So later that year, I hopped on a plane and flew over to, to Canberra, did exactly the same, you know, compiled huge masses of paper, you know, notes and data. Then I thought, okay, where am I going to find some more? Did some more research. Oh, the National Library of Britain, of London, has got uh, a newspaper place in Collindale. Fortunately, that's long since gone right. now. So I did some sums, worked out if I took some time off work. So I did all the. I did three trips in 2009 to DC, then to Canberra, then on to London. Wow. Um, pulling all this data together. And then once I'd done all that, it was a matter of, oh, what do I do with it? <laughs> you know, it was all in spreadsheets and Excel files and um, Word, Word documents. So it was a matter of, what do I do with this? Do I publish it? How do I publish this? Just to jump in before you get to that, John, when you started doing this, was it out of an urge of, 
completeness just to log where everything had been broadcast? Or was it with the mission of trying to find potential avenues for missing episodes? Or what? Was it just a completist? In a way, I guess it was both because my my thinking here was that if we knew the dates when the episodes screened, I think I must have known about the yeah. bicycling at that point. Obviously, because yeah, the, it's recorded in the New Zealand traffic records. So again, it was the yeah. idea being that, okay, if this data could be passed on to somebody who has the resources to do something with it, it could lead to potentially to you know being able to track down um, missing episodes. Mm. But it was at that point already that, although I wasn't aware of it at the time, but this is when you know Phil Morris and Paul had I think were starting to put together their game plan to go overseas and do this research. So. It was right. because I had put this data together that, that I was, when I was first contacted by Paul, just to basically pass that information on, which he yeah. could then use to, um, you know, maybe start the ball rolling, as it were. But the, for me, the main yeah. thing was, what do I do with this information? I can't do much with it myself, because I'm in New Zealand. I don't really have the resources to, to go on missions other than, um, you know, to the libraries. Um, so you've done pretty well. I mean, yeah. You've got a few air miles under your belt by this point. Haven't so, you? from a publishing perspective, it was it was kind of like, well, do I put it together as just a giant PDF, which has just got the air dates, which were, were a bit boring. It needs to have a commentary to go along with it to sort of explain what was going on. Plus, you had to look at the research and the background of the TV stations just to get an idea of the whys and the hows and the whens. And then, uh, by pure fluke, the following year, this is 2010, at the Gallifrey Convention, I just happened to be sitting in line uh, to get onto one of the panels, and as you do, you just start chatting to the people sitting next to you. And the guy that I started chatting with, I discovered, was from Chicago. And I knew that in America, you know, Chicago was the hub of Doctor Who fandom. I just happened to say, out, out of, you know, from the top of my head, oh, you don't by any chance know anybody who might have details about American screenings. And he goes, oh, well, actually, I do. And it was, this uh. was John um, Lavalli, who, the following year, he and I launched Broadcast. So it was by right. a pure fluke. I just happened to be sitting next to the person who had <laughs> you know, the resources to put the website together. You know, the Broadcast website is the result. How does Stephen Hill of Gallifrey Base fit Steve in? runs the server. So Gallifrey Base... Uh, is on the server, broadcast is on that same server, and as is the cutting archive, right. which John also runs. Right. Steve actually came up with the name broadcast and also the logo. I wanted to call it Transmission right. to the Unknown. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a bit too unwieldy, I thought, whereas broadcast is quite nice and snappy, and it has that neat little uh, effect of being able to have the DW logo, as was at that point, yeah, the, the Doctor Who ident that was in use at the time, which had the D and the W in the, t in the shape of a TARDIS. So yeah. it kind of all merged together. I wish I'd known it was a silent W. I've, I've spent years trying to work out how you're supposed to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an immense resource, yeah. John. It's, uh, there are so many months and years poured into it. I mean, I spend, certainly during 2013, I think you must have had the most hits <laughs> yeah. of any website uh, to do with Doctor Who, because you just, it's so accessible and so well put together. It's it, its an amazing piece of work, John. Well, thank Can you. I, thank I'm you. not brown nosing, yeah. but, but I'm going to say thank you on behalf of everyone, <laughs> because it is such a resource. It's free. It's regularly updated. Oh, it's updated it's pretty much every day. Lockdown has meant that I can spend probably more time on it than I probably should. I'll just drop it in the address for anyone who's listening who doesn't look at this fantastic resource. It's www.broadcast, and that's with DW in the middle, .org. And you will spend weeks looking through the work that the Johns have done. I should shout out here that it's not just us two doing it. You know, there are a lot of people who've contributed over the years and continue to do so. They'll send emails, clippings, or little bits of information. Yeah. And on the homepage, there's a huge long list of all the people who have contributed to the site. There's a you know vast number of people. So I, you know, you got to you got to shout out to them. Yeah, as well. indeed. So it's very much a collaborative you know, piece of work. So it's. Uh, can I ask though, John, back in 2012 or then about, you were credited by Paul Venezes on the Missing Episodes Forum as one of the team. 
as one of the people who have made great strides yeah. to establish what's happened to films moving around the world and the, it's self-evident on your website but how does that team operate is it you know do you all live in the same house and often <laughs> well, talk to each other uh, no. or uh, i'm in new zealand is, is there a, is there a concerted project that goes on to find stuff mm. how involved are you in that well no that acknowledgement sort of goes back to what i was saying before when i shared the, the early spreadsheets that i had with with paul and with uh, the two richards and there's also when i was going to the libraries I was also given access uh, or copies of some of the BBC paperwork, which was helpful as well, because as I said, I had a sort of a partial list of the countries where Doctor Who had been sold to over the years. Paul was able to, to supply a much uh, fuller list. These are the, uh, the clearance history sheets that um, have been talked about in the past. So I had that with me when, when I went to the libraries. So it was basically a, um, an information sharing where... Uh, we would discuss and talk and share and um, you know figure out what some of the codings and the writing on these sheets meant because it's all in sort of like abbreviations and codes. So that, that's really all that comes down to. There was no sort of, it's not like we had Skype sessions every night or we were ringing each other up. It was just really, <laughs> if somebody had any information to share, we would just you know, send an email around and just to say, have you noticed right, this? Okay. Or, what does this mean? That was getting on for ten years ago, eight years ago. Is that still going on now? Are you still? Oh, do you still share interesting tips no, that you find? No, and no. I'm still in contact with all three of them to some degree, but you know, mm. I might just have a quick question. I might need to ask one of them about a technical aspect or just a general question. So, sure. but other than that, um, but I've, I have met up with them when I've been in been in London over you know, on the odd occasion. I get across to London like every once every you know ten or so years. <laughs> so, back to the time meddler. I'm just going to pedantically go through one or two of the facts, and then you can take over and explain what they all mean. It was sold, it seems, to eleven countries. I think it's the same as um, the Crusade, the last story we were we touched upon. They're not entirely the same eleven. In particular, it was sold to New Zealand, as we know. It was sold to Nigeria twice which mm -hmm. is quite novel. Uh, you can tell us if, if that's unusual. It was sold once in 1967 as part of a package of the entire first two seasons, which we think was to RKTV Kaduna, and it was sold again quite late in 1973. That's right, yes, but to a different TV station. Indeed. I think we're going to be coming back to that. Also, it's conspicuously not sold to Ethiopia. Do we have any thoughts on why it wasn't? It's hard to say. There could have been... It could have been a story which they were offered but didn't pick up for whatever reason. They didn't want it or um, or it may be that for some reason due to an admin error it was just never part of the package they were given which seems again yeah. unusual. So yeah, it's kind of difficult to judge the exact reasons why they didn't pick it up. I don't think it would come down to the unavailability of the film prints because we know... Um, yeah, this is yeah. 1970, so we know that there were certainly copies of the film prints out there that they could have easily, have, um, you know, and it was used. still on offer, wasn't it, up until 1974? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, um, it's seven years usually from the day of, uh, from the year of broadcast, so that would be uh, 72. Yeah, I'm just reading off your own website. I'm afraid. <laughs> 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 well, the good thing about the website, it can be changed and updated. So uh, if you do spot anything that's wrong, I can quickly change it while we're talking. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you you say it was being offered in, in 1974. It was still on offer as part of a package of Hartnell stories that included the Space Museum and Galaxy 4. I mean, by 74, the number of stories available is starting to shrink rapidly, isn't it? And we're rather than these big blocks that we had before, you're down to just odds and sods. That's right, because... Uh, the way the rights, the BBC, the, the, the BBC's rights to sell a program was usually seven years from the initial broadcast. But for the first two seasons of Doctor Who, I think that was originally only five years. So what they did was at the end or close to the end of the first five year period, they would renew it for a second five year period or they would renew it for a seven year period. So you get an overlap yeah. where seasons one and two, because they got renewed, actually were still yeah, were still available, 
when seasons three, four, five, and six had already expired and hadn't been renewed. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why the negatives for all for season one and two were still held by the BBC as late as seventy eight, because the rights to them were still active or were recently active. It's maybe too big a topic to get into, but you suggested on broad broadcast that <laughs> the second sale of Nigeria in seventy three may have been to make up for the lack of a sale to Ethiopia. Now, I think what you're referring to there is your suggestion that the, the certain number of sales was always was needed to balance the books on the BBC right. spreadsheets. Yeah. Is that right? So That's could you right. Explain yeah. that in an easy to understand form for our layman audience. OK, I'll try to do try to do this without needing a PowerPoint display. I don't know what the official technical term is for it, but I call it the Commonwealth quota. And so it worked on the basis that when the BBC sold a program to the Commonwealth, a fee was payable to equity, which has basically covered your, um, you know, the actors' residuals. It wasn't paid on a country-by-country country or sale-to-country basis. That This fee was payable on a regional basis. So the BBC sells a program to Australia. The BBC then pays to equity the Commonwealth fee. And that gives the BBC the ability to then sell that program to as many countries within the Commonwealth that it can do to recoup that cost. Right. The BBC wants to be able to recoup that cost as quickly as possible. So it's going to sell it to as many countries it can as quickly as it can, but it also wants to sell it to as few countries as it can to recoup that money. So let's just throw a figure out for easy calculation. The program is offered to Australia. Australia is Commonwealth. The BBC pays equity a thousand pounds per episode. I'm making that figure up, but just using this as an example. The money that Australia pays to the BBC only covers a portion of that fee that it's paid to equity. So the BBC then needs to sell the same program to some more Commonwealth countries, but they probably can't afford to pay the £250, which is the balance to make up the difference. So the BBC will probably calculate, say, if we sell it to three countries and charge them each £150, or two countries that charge them £175, yeah, whatever, they scale it down mm. and offer it to what they call the minor Commonwealth countries to get that money back. Once they've recouped that £1,000, the next time they offer it and sell it to another Commonwealth country, it starts again. They have to pay the Commonwealth quota. So in the case of Ethiopia, when Time Meddler was up for sale, it had seven years. So from 65, that's still 72. So some point during 1972, some bean counter at the BBC would have gone, have we recouped all our costs? Oh shit, no, we haven't. There's still £10 owing for the Time Meddler. Because it didn't get sold to Ethiopia, there's a hole. We need to sell it somewhere to get the money back. Where can we sell it to? Yeah. And this is where Midwest comes into play. Thank you. I think that was I think that was very clear. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. So we've got a certain number of prints to service these 11 countries. And we're not going to look in detail as to what happened to every single one. But just in general, uh, Australia uh, did what they usually did, which they, they were very rarely bicycled on, where they, uh, they returned them, in this case, to the BBC in 1975. And yeah. New Zealand sent their prints on to Nigeria in 1973 so these, yes. they're getting a lot of they're getting their money's worth out of these prints where were they sold to we think it's probably midwest tv at least that's the latest thinking which i've seen on the excellent website broadcast i have to confess that the nigerian page on broadcast is currently out of date i've done a pretty much a page one rewrite the interesting thing about the midwest tv station was it had only started transmitting in April of 73. So if New Zealand has sent its prints there in March of 73, it was obviously done in a way that it got there in time for them to start um, to start screening. So you've got the overlap of dates there. It, it's a perfect synchronization. Here's a mm. TV station that's just started broadcasting. It's hungry for material. The BBC's got one sale of this bloody story that needs to, to recoup all its costs. Here's a TV station, probably wants to buy cheap programming. 
we'll sell it time meddler because we need to you know complete that one sale but we need to find a print from somewhere oh new zealand's got theirs we'll get them to send that over so if we cut to 1976 and what the bbc had if i've got it right it's not likely that they would have had the original negatives and so they held all of the time meddler but they would have been returned prints yeah um obviously we don't know where those film prints came from it's probably likely that they're the, they're from australia because they were sent back only a matter of months earlier but yeah the because when uh, who's doctor who was being uh, produced there was a list of episodes that were still held and all of time meddler was there and all of galaxy 4 was there as late as late 76 by 1977 all we had left was episode two, which seems to suggest that they'd jumped three of the four episodes they had, but it's not quite that simple, is it? Because there are multiple copies of episode two. So is it possible that the BBC had, in 1976, one copy of the entire story and a spare episode two, and that what was junked in the, in the next 12 months was the entire story leaving just this duplicate? Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Um, because I think we've established that there were four prints, four sets of prints, possibly to service yep. you know, the, the, yep. the, 11, the 11 countries. So there's three copies of part two that have can be accounted for. But the question is, is are, are two of those prints actually the same one? Um, <laughs> or are they different? three episodes show up in the hands of a collector he's got episode one two and three and then nigeria produces episodes one two three and four but are the episodes that were found in the hands of a collector or the three three of the four from 76 or are they another another set of prints it's, it's very confusing <laughs> without getting ahead of ourselves yeah <laughs> if the bbc had one two three and four and junked one three and four that doesn't overlap with the ones that were found with the collector who had one, two, and three. No. Whichever way you cut it and slice it and dice it, there are more yeah. copies of episode three lying around than there are episode the two, others. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the point is we're never going to get to the bottom of this. So I'm going to draw a line under it and say <laughs> yeah. that by the, uh, we need to move into the 80s now. So close the 70s, into the 80s, into the Doctor Winter special list. There's only one episode existing. Obviously, it's number two. But then... Do we have to thank Ian Levine for what happens next? <laughs> I think we have to thank Terry Wogan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently it was the, there was a radio interview with somebody who had been to Nigeria recently and who made the witty comment that the television system in Nigeria is so backwards they're still showing Patrick Troughton episodes of Doctor Who. And it's probably on Terry Wogan's breakfast show that that was on. Nobody's actually come up with a recording of this, which would be quite fun if somebody did. <laughs> um, but, but people hearing this comment, you know, including Ian Levine, I think, you know, set the ball rolling to try and track down all these missing Troutons in Nigeria. And this right. is what starts his program of uh, taking, well, according to him, does he take up space in the BBC, sitting next to a fax machine, firing out questionnaires to every country can think of yeah i believe so uh, i think he said he had a copy of the making of doctor who and sending telexes to the countries listed in there i mean it goes back to my what i said uh, a long time back was that you know there wasn't really a full list of all the countries that doctor who had who uh, had been sold to at that point i think there's only like 20 countries out of potentially 30 plus at that point so Telexes were sent out and somehow he was put in touch with somebody who worked at the Nigerian Television Authority. Where's yeah. this in Kaduna or Lagos? Um, Lagos, I believe. Potted history here. Nigerian Television Authority was, was set up to coordinate and combine all the television stations within Nigeria into one. Um, it's like a network. At some point in the late 70s this happened, wasn't it? 76 yeah um because nigeria at the time was made up of like three or four different sort of states and then various political and uh, coups took place and these states slowly got sort of divided up into smaller states and as that happened each of these states 
set up its own television station, usually from a propaganda point of view. <laughs> so by 73, which is when Midwest was there, there was only like five or six TV stations. But by 84, 1984, there were 30. Mm. And so the Nigerian Television Authority was set up to kind of um, like to control the television set up within the country. And so it was through them, uh, through through somebody working for them, I believe, is how the episodes that Ed Levine uh, tracked, which was Web Planet, Time Meddler and War Machines, um, came to be found. Now, I'm going to ask your opinion on something. There's a, <laughs> a difference of opinion on something that shouldn't be contentious. Paul Venezes has suggested that when the Nigerian Television Authority was set up, they didn't just oversee these different stations, but they brought all the f film prints from these disparate archives around the country into one central storage area in Lagos. Phil Morris has said, there's this rumour going around that there was one central archive for the NTA. It's not true. Um, seeming unaware that it's his good mate, uh, the Lennon and McCartney of yeah. Missing Episodes <laughs> Research, who's, who he's dissing here. What do you think? 50-50 on this. It took a long time for the NTA to get fully established. So I do kind of think that they would probably have sent out a telex or whatever the equivalent was that they used back in those days to these stations saying, can you do this? Some probably did do so, some probably didn't. So so there may be a, may have been a place in Lagos where some old film mm. stock was, was pulled out of the various film libraries. I don't like calling them archives because that's, wrong, that's the wrong course, terminology. No. And we know that some didn't because of what happened... You know, later on. It's a shame that we'll probably never know the process by which those 1980s prints were sent back or where they were sent back from. Because exactly. we don't know whether yeah, they that's... were dispatched from Midwest or whether they yeah. were dispatched from Lagos. Quite interesting, but also interesting that it would seem to me to suggest what you just said, John, that you speculate that some of the, the stations could do it and some couldn't, some did, some didn't. It seems unlikely that Midwest would somehow say we're not capable of sending you our film stock and then they'd acquiesce to a request from the BBC to ship back uh, however many films of Doctor Who it is. So to me it suggests that it might be from a central store that they were sent. The only account that we've got of this is that there's a, a, a woman, Virginia somebody, Victoria somebody, I can't think of the name, who's the one that Levine was dealing with. We don't know what her capacity was, what who she was or where mm. she was, and all we know is that she found these three stories somewhere. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's one of the things that irks me about some of this, the, these events is that nobody ever kept proper record <laughs> <laughs> of of the findings, you know, because it always proves helpful in later years. Mm. You know, yes, they found three of these things, but could there be more? It was almost like we've got these three back. Thank you, <laughs> and that was it. They didn't bother well, following uh, it up or, or uh, keeping a record or notes of the who's, the where's, and the when's. I, I don't wish yes. to completely derail this, but whatever happened and whoever replied and wherever Virginia or Victoria was working, she certainly couldn't speak for the holdings at BPTV Joss, which also would no. have been by that point under the NTA. It would have been, yes, absolutely. I'm only guessing here, I wouldn't have a clue. It may be that she actually had worked at Midwest mm. in whatever capacity she had and she knew the people who were there. So it was a quick phone call. They yeah. then produced these three and that was as far as it went. Yeah, you know, she may not have sent out a telex or an email or whatever the equivalent was in those days to all the other NTA stations. Yeah, but yeah, indeed, because we also have an inkling that the entirety of season one was set in Kaduna at that time yeah, as well. I, again, it comes down to we haven't been told the full story, so it's very hard to get a clear picture on what transpired and what what didn't happen. But the thing is, of course, is that. The three stories that they produced were the three stories that screened at Midwest. It's not a random collection of three stories, it's the three stories that Midwest had. So they've obviously all come from the same place. And um, just for clarity, the three stories are the spare copy of The Web Planet and the missing Time Meddler and War Machines. So, thanks to Ian Levine via Terry Wogan, we now have back two almost nigh on complete William Hartnell stories. There are some cuts to these 
episodes, some of which can be explained by the New Zealand censors and some of which can't, like the entire first five minutes of episode one of The Time Meddler is Missing. Yeah, um, I can give you some facts and figures here. New Zealand received a batch of 44 episodes, which spans the Space Museum through to the 10th planet in mid-1968. These were progressively sent to the censor over a four-month period, and once all 44 episodes had been censored and rated, they were then lodged into the NZBC Film Library together on the 23rd of September 1968. But before they could be broadcast, they needed to be certified. So episode 1 and 2 was censored on the 3rd of July 68. Episodes 3 and 4 were censored a week later on the 16th. And there are bits in the episodes that the censor didn't like. So they took the scissors to them. There's a thing called the Notice by the Censor of Excision from Films. And this is a, a memo that the censor writes up to make a log of all the cuts they've made to TV programs every day. And luckily the ones for Doctor Who still exist. And I found them in the offices of the film censor in Wellington back in 20... When did I do this? 2012? It was quite some time ago. I was quite surprised that these things still existed. So I'll read out what they say. It's quite funny. So on the 3rd of July, 68, episode The Meddling Monk, it says, Reduce or delete threat with knife. Twice. Reduce battle, particularly close stabbings and blows, etc. Then from a battle of wits, it says, it says Delete threat with knife and remark, Go on, kill me. <laughs> and then and then for checkmate it says delete killing of vikings after they surrender so that's the infamous bit of yes. dialogue that currently still doesn't exist i think maybe we should explain why it is that the um, of all those many sensor cuts the only ones that's still causing us a problem is is the one in episode four that's because sometime l later we found yet more copies of episodes one two and three you've alluded to it earlier you've said that a collect in the mid 70s a collector gets hold of these three episodes so the collector is ian sherwood yeah ian sherwood he acquired them from another collector mm. who had 20 or so various episodes of doctor who he had episode one two and three but they were only interested in one and three because they because the bbc already had episode two and it wasn't until later that someone else bought this guy's print of part two these finally made their way back to the BBC via Ian Levine again. And they're all uncut. Yeah, so the, so the cuts that were made to the New Zealand prints that were then covered from Nigeria could be repaired or patched in by the prints that um, were, later, were later found. Yeah, so the Nigerian episode 1 print is known to have the TARDIS scene cut out at the start, presumably, so they could drop it in as a random Doctor Who episode without having to bother about having missed the events of the previous... That's right. The, the New Zealand film logs record the date the episodes were lodged into the yeah. film library. They also record the censorship uh, classification, which, which in this case is a G for general, and also yeah. has the running duration after the film prints have been to the censor. So in the case of The Watcher, the duration that's logged into the register is 24.05. Right. 24 minutes, 5 seconds, which is like one or two seconds different from, in inverted commas, the official BBC duration. Yeah. There's always got to be a give and take between, you know, by a couple of seconds, just simply because we don't, we're not sure of how, what timing, um, you know, the, the procedure they use, whether they just have a stopwatch and they just stop and start when the credits roll, or whether there's a, there's always going to be a couple of seconds either side because we don't know when they stop the stopwatch. Is it when there's a fade to black or when the logo pops up? We don't know. But when the prints were found in Nigeria, uh, I think they ran to 23 minutes. So there was a whole, the whole segment at the beginning of the episode when just after the TARDIS materializes on the beach, there's a close up of Vicky studying the clock, which is when the watch caption mm. comes up. And it then suddenly jumps to the Stephen and the Doctor and Vicky emerging from the TARDIS. Oh, right. So all that stuff with the panda, them finding Stephen on board, that's all gone. That was all missing. It's not known, therefore, if that was cut by the NZBC, not the censor, but by the NZBC, or by 
the Nigerian TV station. One or the other made that edit for whatever reason. If it was Nigeria, maybe because they wanted commercial time, they needed to reduce the episodes by commercial time, but then none of the other episodes are cut to that degree. Or it may have been a, an editorial decision because they're talking about the events of the chase. Yep. Now, the chase never screened in New Zealand. Ah. So it's possible that the NZBC just thought that, okay, they're talking about a story which we haven't actually shown. Yeah. Let's just remove it just to avoid any confusion. Because it, it seems more plausible to me that it would be the NZBC. Because that sort yeah. of editorial due diligence would happen with a, a country which has screened a great deal of Doctor Who, whereas Midwest, who have just ordered <laughs> the Web Planet, the Time Medal, and the War Machines, they're not going to give a toss about messing that's, up that's continuity, correct, yeah, are they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Although, um, so we, we never got the Dalek invasion of Earth either, but we did get the rescue, which opens up you know, the, the first yeah. few moments of that is, is the Doctor and Ian Barbara discussing the departure of Susan. So, but as far as we know, that was intact. It might not have been. We don't know because, you know, those New, New Zealand episodes have never been found. Fascinating. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we get up to 1992 and the BBC make it known that they're going to run a repeat season and they're going to screen the Time Meddler. And is it Steve Roberts who pipes up and says, no, hang on, I know where we can get a, a better copy of, of what there is. And Ian Levine has sat on these prints for a number of years but obviously he's told Steve Roberts and others that he has them and I think Ian Levine has sometimes been maligned that he hoarded this print for a while is there any fairness in that as far as everybody was concerned there was already copies of uh, the time meter in existence yeah. the fact that there was an another set out there was kind of like yeah, a redundant set it didn't really matter are these the prints that Ian Levine has said he he held on to so that he had something to bargain with, yeah. to trade with, if somebody offered him a genuinely missing episode. <laughs> so for him, it was a compromise. He didn't sit on an, a completely missing episode. He sat on one which had a bit of extra footage so he could feel morally. he And and as you say, he'd told the BBC, so it was always... Mm. Yeah. He wasn't doing it behind their backs. Yeah. And thankfully, because, because of that chain of events, we all got to see it in 92, uh, and it's the fullest form it's currently available in. And for many of us, I guess that was the first time we'd seen it at all. It certainly was for me. What about you? It was definitely for me. Was like I was four when the Time Medal had screened in New Zealand, but um, obviously it must have been after my bedtime because it was one I never got to see at the time. They did repeat, now NZBC did repeat, uh, TVNZ then did repeat the Time Medal um, in 2003. I'll have to check that. It was just a one-off screening for some bizarre reason, but uh, I've commented on this before. The, you know, here here we are on you know, watching this this story on television in New Zealand, of which at least episode four is the exactly the same print or copy of the same print that had previously screened in New Zealand way back in 1968. You know, it's not. <laughs> a, it, it, you know, it is literally the very same. You know, visual image, which is quite funny. <laughs> I think the 92 repeat was responsible for creating quite a few new fans. Doctor Who hadn't been shown for a few years at that point, had it? So it just caught a few people. It's certainly the first time I saw it, and it was part of that wonderful repeat season. Did they show the Sea Devil? Uh, the Mind Robber? Was yeah. that part of it? And then the Sea Devils? Yeah, th yeah there was 92. 92 to 93, yeah. there, was, there were two sort of seasons of repeats. Yeah, it was magical for me because I I collected the VHSs and the Time Meddler was magical. I'd already seen the Mind Robber, but the Sea Devils was the first time I'd seen the Roger Delgado Master, believe it or not. And so that was a magical experience watching wow. watching him in that. That was really good. And then shortly after that, you started getting well. There was a Demons repeat, wasn't there? So you got more of it. And then they they released Terror of the Autons colorized on video and so on and so forth. But that was a, a particularly magical moment in my um, fandom that 92 repeat series that was that was my five faces of doctor who yeah because they preceded this the, the repeat of the watcher uh with the infamous resistances yeah uh, useless um uh, documentary <laughs> yeah with the anorak do you think it's fair to say that the monk himself was never really f the character was never forgotten by fans in the way it was by the television program 
I feel like I'd have read about him in Doctor Who Weekly. Yeah. He popped again in some in some cartoons, uh, comic strips in the monthly during the mm. 80s. There was a whole yeah. series of the uh, the new adventures featured the monk. Mm. I was very fond of that short yeah. run, five books, yeah. 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 Blood yeah. Heat to No Future. No, no, few, no like, Future, yeah. Was he, was, wasn't he called Mortimus? They, they, they... Paul Cornell called him Mortimus, yeah, which, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I quite like that. I remember being very fond of... Yeah, and that Mortim- name crops up in, in Doctor Who magazine later on. And, um, you know, while we're on this tangent, I don't know, I said, the the books kept him alive, the comic strips kept him alive, and, and Big Finish have, have done quite good work with... Uh, hush. <laughs> Big Finish have done good work with The Monk. Have they? Uh, I don't know. They, they, first, they first brought him back... I mean, they've had to recast him, obviously, but they've made some interesting choices. First time they brought him back, and it was quite a big surprise at the time, he was played by Graham Garden. And more recently... Oh, good. Yet again... As a major twist, he's been played by Rufus Hound. So they've um, they've certainly got their money's worth out of the character. Are they still calling him the monk, though? Because that's not actually his name. He was... The thing is, the weird, weird thing about the monk, of course, is that, you know, he was disguised as a monk because he was based in a monastery. So it only makes perfect sense for him to be wearing a monk's habit. So why 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 does he still call himself the monk, and does he still wear a monk's habit in all his um, subsequent appearances? <laughs> well, the TV program has already set the precedent to that, of course, because he's dressed as a monk when he shows up in the Dark's Master Plan for no for no reason. Yeah, but that's because so, he, he's, he's lost the he's lost there. his he's, he's lost his TARDIS wardrobe. You got to remember the Doctor shrunk the interior, which therefore lost the wardrobe. <laughs> so he's wearing literally the only clothes he's got. How did he get to Egypt if he can't use the TARDIS? Well, he can use it. He just—it's only—it's only the console room. He's lost the wardrobe, so he's got no other clothes. Right. John, this is all happening in your head. <laughs> <laughs> you do realise that. I, I don't think your 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 brain canon has any more claim to legitimacy than uh, any of the other fictional variations. I tell you what. Um, I, am I allowed to plug my own work? Can I can I plug something which I'm not actually going to financially benefit from because it hasn't been released yet? Is that fair, Tim? That's fine, yeah. Yeah, hopefully there's a future Big Finish story featuring the monk coming out, which which riffs on um, a line from the Time Meddler, so it is entirely on topic. When when he's boasting to the Doctor about all the other great things he could do if he is allowed to just tweak history, he fantasises about the idea of Shakespeare premiering Hamlet on television rather than on stage. And... Um, yeah, I was I was asked if I could come up with a storyline. I've do got just a title for that it. Idea, you call I... it TV or not TV. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do use that gag, John. <laughs> <laughs> so this is written and in, in, in and awaiting recording, is it, Paul? It's a wait. It's a waiting recording. Yes, I mean, obviously, with the current situation, some people have <laughs> some recordings of. Um, have carried on during these strange situation and other people i can't say who's in it hopefully hopefully rufus sound but um to be to be continued watch this space i find it interesting and sad that it hasn't been brought back for the tv series and that it's been such a, a fertile ground for the new adventures and for big finish you'd think it would have almost unlimited potential they revisited a similar sort of <laughs> inane scheme in in the king's demons of course when it made absolutely <laughs> no sense for the master to be wanting to have magna carta not no. signed or whatever changing it to, changing <laughs> it to the monk and putting in a few jokes would have lifted that enormously it would have done wouldn't it poor old terence dudley <laughs> let's draw this to the clo- to a close i have two small items to cover one is that there is a much broader nigeria story to be told john so i'd very much hope that you'll come back perhaps for the war machines perhaps another time and we can talk some more absolutely sure i can do that um as i say i've i've got this update to the nigeria page as i said it's it's pretty much almost a page one rewrite because there's a lot of errors uh errors but not i mean yeah, there's a few errors in the current page, plus there's a lot of new information to be added, a few more maps and some graphics that I've uh, since found, which I want to put up. So it may take me a while to actually get that 
done. Um, Fantastic. Obviously, with the pandemic happening, some of the research lines that I had, like to the, um, to, to, for some microfilms or some newspapers I had, um, has, has closed up for now. So, put it this way, I've got the choice of either publishing it as it is now, warts mm. and all, or I can wait till it's actually properly finished. So, if you want to put it to the vote, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll do it twist but ball. yeah, yeah. So it, it, there's a lot of new information that I've got that I can put on there. So it's something we can talk about at a later, at, on a later session. Cool. Uh, secondly, Andrew on Twitter has asked, has said, you've got to ask John what chance we, is we have of finding an uncut episode four. My. Re- <laughs> My response was, he doesn't want to hear my response, but my response was that I guess if one, two, three <laughs> were out there, then there's a, a decent probability that four is out there somewhere to be found. But that would be in the hands of a collector, you mean? Yeah. It's always possible, yeah. Um, again, we don't know the full story of how those three particular episodes got to be where they were, but I, I believe that one of the people who had previously owned it had worked at the BBC, so it's easy to see how the films had gone from the BBC into the collector's network, so there's, that's there. So, But as you say, you know, was number four lying in the same pile as one, two, and three? Mm. Um, was it separated? Did the guy take all four, but then lost lost number four at some point? You know, Again, we do not know this info. We, we do not know. You mentioned um, that so the, it could the be collector who Mr. Sheward uh, got his one, two, and three off had 20-odd other episodes of Doctor Who, presumably all extant episodes. That's correct. I believe it's the same guy who had the, the Abominable Snowmen 2 and Invasion of the Dinosaurs. I think it's the same guy yeah. who had all of those, plus some others which were... were he also had Tenth Planet Part 2, another copy of that, and a whole lot of others. Again, we don't know if this person is the sole source of all those episodes or whether he's collected them over the period of time and got them from various different places... Yeah, you know, it would be it would be helpful to know that and sort of, that sort of information to mm. be able to trace it back. Mm. Okay, fantastic. And finally, John, it would be absolutely irresponsible of me not to ask you to wildly speculate on what will happen next. Will the next episode found be from a television station or from a private collector? Oh gosh. Um, I would say that a private collector was far more likely to produce the goods than even after all this time for there still to be a television station out there that's still sitting on this material after all this time. Okay, Joss, you know, six years ago, but Nigeria is like its own little bubble. You can't really juxtapose what happened in Nigeria with any other country just simply because most countries operate... You know, one TV station. Nigeria had dozens of TV stations, and so the film prints were moving around a lot. So, therefore, the fact that some ended up sitting on a shelf in Joss you know, is probably bound to happen, whereas those same circumstances aren't likely to happen uh, anywhere else. So, I think I think collectors, you know, private collectors out there, probably sitting on material. But as for TV stations. I honestly don't think that the likelihood of any any further episodes turning up from that source uh, um, is, is likely. But I mean, love to be I would love to be proved wrong. To quote or to misquote Ian Levine, there will always be ninety seven missing episodes. <laughs> well, that concludes our episode about the time meddler john preddle thank you so much for joining us really appreciate it you taking the time and as paul would say navigating the 12 hour time difference paul thank you very much my pleasure i was i was here anyway thank you for the thanks (laughs) and please do get in touch with us on twitter i am at Doctor Who Podcasters with a DR. Paul is at Mr. Paul Morris. We also have a Facebook page, so you can look up Doctor Who and the Podcasters on Facebook and you can join our page for conversation and updates on the podcast. Please do, if you're listening on Apple, on iTunes, please do leave us a comment because our comments will help us top the TV review charts in Finland. And (laughs) (laughs) next time... We hope you join us to be talking about Galaxy 4. Goodbye. See you later. Bye. What do you mean?
may be. What do you think it is, a space helmet for a cow? 